Good day. I am uh, Dr. Tekia Palata, a clinical microbiologist, and uh, today we are going to discuss acute respiratory tract infection. And uh, this lecture will be conducted in two parts. The first part will deal with a uh, viral respiratory tract infection, and the second part will discuss uh, bacterial respiratory tract infection. So let me just uh, share this uh, presentation with you. As I said, that we are going to discuss the acute respiratory infections. And during this first part, we will mainly focus on viral respiratory tract infections. Once again, good afternoon. I am a Dr. Tekea Palata, a consultant in clinical microbiology. So, viral respiratory infections, we have uh, uh, one of the viral infection is what we call uh, rhinitis or coryza or known as common cold. And uh, most cases of common cold are caused by a virus, uh, are caused by rhinoviruses in 80% of the cases. Those cases of rhinitis or common cold are caused by rhinoviruses. And we have uh, several serotypes of uh, rhinoviruses. That's why you have different flu vaccines depending on the commonest serotypes that uh, can occur. And the rest are caused by different coronaviruses. There are also uh, the coronavirus. It is very rare to see flu or common cold that is caused by influenza or parainfluenza viruses or adenoviruses or RSV or other antiroviruses. So, what you should remember is that when we speak about rhinitis, remember rhinoviruses. Okay, then the second one is pharyngitis. Now, pharyngitis that is caused by viruses, uh, the, the, the virus that is causing pharyngitis are actually adenoviruses. So adenoviruses are causing pharyngitis. Then we have uh, laryngotracheitis. Laryngotracheitis is caused by a parainfluenza, a virus called parainfluenza. Okay. And then you have bronchitis, acute bronchitis. Now, all these viruses, particularly influenza, parainfluenza, respiratory syncytium virus, can cause bronchitis in healthy people. But they are also implicated in what we call the exacerbation of COPD, you know, exacerbation of COPD or asthma and cystic fibrosis. So they are also implicated in the exacerbation of COPD, asthma and cystic fibrosis, but all of them, influenza, para-influenza, RSV, they are associated with acute bronchitis. So pneumonia, Really, in healthy people, to see viral pneumonia is extremely rare. But if it does happen, usually it's caused by influenza. And rarely it can be caused by measles or by VZV, that is varicella zoster virus. You know, otherwise, it's very uncommon. But we can find, commonly we find viral pneumonitis among immunosuppressed patients, especially in our setting in South Africa where we have many HIV infected patients, or you can find also viral pneumonia in patients with uh, bone marrow or solid organ transplant patient, or in patients receiving immunosuppressive treatment, or patients who are receiving anti-cancer drugs, or very young premature neonates, or very old patients, you know, whose immuno, uh, Im immune system is suppressed. So those are the patients who can develop what we call viral pneumonitis. But in healthy patients, it is very rare. So if you have viral pneumonitis in immunosuppressed patient, you can suspect two viruses. One is CMV, that is cytomegalovirus, and the second one is HSV, that is herpes simplex virus. Those are associated with viral pneumonitis in uh, immunosuppressed patients. In addition, HIV itself, HIV infection, 
has been known to be associated directly uh, with causing uh, viral pneumonitis. So it gives you a picture that we call a non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. And we have other rare specific causes of viral respiratory tract infection. We have seen cases of recurrent respiratory papillomatosis that is caused by HPV, human papilloma virus. We have severe pneumonia caused by hunter virus. We have uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis caused by EBV or hepatitis C virus. And we have COPD that is caused by adenovirus. But all these have been uh, unproven associations. So they have been found to be associated with uh, those cases. And we have also what we call emerging respiratory viruses. Among the emerging respiratory viruses, we have SARS-associated coronavirus, and we have avian influenza virus. We have the others, but we are among the emerging respiratory viruses. We will focus on those two. We will focus on coronavirus and avian influenza virus. So SARS-associated coronavirus, what is first a coronavirus? A coronavirus represents a family of enveloped, single-stranded RNA viruses that cause illnesses. Those illnesses are ranging from the common cold, you know, to more severe diseases, you know. And here we have uh, severe diseases. We have uh, like a severe acute respiratory syndrome that we call SARS. We also have another uh, disease caused by coronavirus that is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. And we have a third one now, the latest one that we call the COVID-19. So the name coronavirus comes from the Latin word corona, that is meaning, that means crown. So you can see here the structure of the virus. It's a corona, it's a crown, it's a halo. You know, so under an electronic microscope, the image of the virus looks like a, a solar corona. That's what you, you can see here. So these viruses, coronaviruses, were originally transmitted between animals and people. For instance, SARS was transmitted from a civet cat to humans. You know, it was from a civet cat to humans, while MERS is travel to humans from a type of camel. You know, it's from camel transmitted to the humans. And the novel coronavirus that is causing COVID-19, that is a, a new strain that had not been previously identified in human and was believed to be transmitted from pangolin. You see pangolin here. So the initial infection has been from animal to humans and after that, then we have transmission between humans, but initially it's animal to human. Okay. Now, beside the coronavirus, we have also what we call avian influenza virus that has been also involved in a number of outbreaks and pandemics, like the H1N1 strand that caused the pandemic in 1918. In 1957, we have the H2N2. 1968, we have the H3N2. 77, we have H1N1 again. And 1997, we have uh, H5N1. And 1998, H9N2. Uh, and so on, the latest one was H5N1. So they are all causing uh, serious pandemics. And uh, those are the animals that have been involved in those different pandemics. And the reason is that those viruses are able to mutate much more easily through mechanism that we will study, what we call it either antigenic drift or antigenic shift. So when there is an antigenic drift, there are slight changes in the genetic makeup of the virus. But during antigenic shift, there is a complete uh, appearance of a new virus, a brand new strand of the virus. Now, what is the pathogenesis of this viral respiratory tract infection? So the main reservoir of respiratory viruses is the upper airway. So the upper 
airway is the reservoir of those viruses. And it's spread by three ways, direct contact from the secretions of droplets or airborne. Now, the difference between droplet and airborne, it's mainly the size of the particle. Now, during a droplet infection, transmission through droplets, particles are large, you know, above 10 micrometer in diameter. So they cannot travel long distances, they can fall within a beta. But during airborne infection, you have particles that are smaller than 5 micrometer. In diameter, they can remain suspended into air and they can travel long distances. So that's why in trying to prevent droplet borne infection, the distance between two patients, uh, between two beds in the hospital facility is very important. And also the use of mask. But in airborne transmission, ventilation is very important to try to to curb the transmission of airborne infection and also the use of respirators. Then, whilst viral invasion of the upper respiratory tract is, uh, is the basic mechanism, pathogenesis for various respiratory viruses are somewhat different, you know. So the reservoir is the same, the mechanism of spread of those viruses look the same, but to invade the human cells, you know, the mechanism is different because those viruses attach into different receptors. For example, if we look at the rhinoviruses that cause common cold, following inoculation into uh, the nasal cavity, you know, um, human rhinoviruses are transported into the posterior nasopharynx. So they are taken into the posterior nasopharynx by ciliated epithelial cells. So if you are a patient, you are someone, you are a smoker, your ciliated epithelial cells uh, might have been damaged, you know, so it's very difficult, you know, uh, for you to clear some of those viruses. So ciliated epithelial cells, they play a, a, a role in trying to clear. So they take those bacteria, those uh, viruses. But what happened that when they reach the nasopharynx, they actually gain entry into the host cell following attachment to intercellular adhesion molecule. So they attach to IKM1. So those are receptors for human rhinoviruses. Then these will result in viral infection, stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system and activate several inflammatory pathways. And the host response to the virus is then believed to be the major cause of cold symptoms that we observe. So as the cold progresses, the viruses moves then from the posterior side to more anteriorly into the nest. And the prominent symptoms, you, you then, the patient start uh, uh, experiencing rhinorrhea, so running of the nose and nasal uh, obstructions, you know, as a result of increased vascular permeability with leakage of the serum into the nasal mucosa. So cold symptoms also are caused by neurogenic reflexes triggered by the infection. Uh, beside that, if we look at the SARS-associated coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses, they enter the target cells via specific receptor-mediated endocytosis that is driven by the spike glycoprotein. So those are specific receptors for coronaviruses. And this spike, or S, serves as the major viral attachment protein before binding and fusion. So it needs to attach to that spike glycoprotein, then you have fusion, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, you have inversion that will occur. So angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and CD209L are receptors for the SARS-associated uh, coronavirus. So a SARS disease model actually consists of three phases. So the initial phase is the viral replication. Then after that, you have immune hyperactivity and pulmonary destruction. So it's at that stage where you, the patient then starts observing complication 
in uh, in the lung so they have uh, respiratory problems you know they will then require mechanical ventilation so the SARS pathology of the lung has been associated with diffuse alveolar damage epithelial cell proliferation and the increase of macrophages um, the third example is the influenza virus so influenza virus actually we need to understand what we call antigenic shift and antigenic uh, drift. We say that antigenic shifts are minor changes in the genetic uh, element of uh, the virus, but the antigenic shift is the procedure by which, or the process by which there is a, a new strain, a brand new strain of the virus that occurs. Okay, now how this happened? Usually the infection starts from the migratory water bed. That's where the influenza virus starts here. So this virus at this stage is not yet able to infect uh, humans. Then from there, the virus can be transmitted to the domestic bed, from the migratory water bed to the domestic bed. Then from there, it can then be able to infect the human host. And from there, it will then adapt to the, to the epithelium cells, epithelium, epithel, epithelial cells of the human host, then allowing now human to human transmission from occurring. So what we happen in during antigenic shift is that uh, in the respiratory epithelial cells, you have the human virus with the non-human virus that will come together. You have a process of gene reassortment to form a new virus, then from there, this new virus will then be able to infect other humans. So migratory water bed to the domesticated bed, then sometimes it can even move to the, to the pig, then from there, here in the epithelium of the pig, that is not very, very different from the human epithelium. And where, the two viruses will mix for and will undergo the process of gene reassortment for the formation of the new virus. That is the new virus. Now, this new virus will then be able to be transmitted from human to human. Then you have a pandemic that will occur. So the pandemic strain reassortment in a human can also be directly from migratory bed to the domestic bed. Then from there, uh, to the human and you have a new virus, then you have human to human transmission. Now, in terms of laboratory diagnosis of viral acute respiratory infection, the specimen to be collected are nasopharyngeal aspirate or washing or swabs that can be taken and the test can be uh, molecular tests from those swabs. We can do uh, molecular uh, PCR. We can also do serology when you collect a blood specimen and we can do viral isolation using cell culture techniques. And the management, the prevention is done through vaccines. Uh, some of them have vaccines like the COVID-19. Vaccines uh, are still underway. We don't have yet a vaccine on the market, but other viral infections, we already have vaccines. And we can also uh, use chemoprophylaxis, especially for travelers and for immunocompromised patients. And the treatment, the mechanism of action, uh, uh, there are different mechanisms of action for different antiviral agents. And the other challenge with the treatment now is the resistance with some of them. Now, let's look at the vaccines. We have two groups of vaccines. We have what we call inactivated or killed vaccine, like the vaccine that we have for influenza A and B. The disadvantage here is that uh, it has a reduced cell-mediated immune response as compared to live attenuated vaccine. The live attenuated vaccine, like vaccine for measles and other influenza A and B and VZV, so varicella zoster virus that use live attenuated. Here, the advantage is that you have a strong immune response, but with inactivated vaccine, the, there is a reduced cell mediated uh, immune response. But the advantage for inactivated or killed uh, 
based vaccine is they are stable in their formulation and also for safety reasons, especially for immunocompromised patients. But the disadvantage for live attenuated is that the strong and uh, humoral cell mediated, the disadvantage is risk for immunocompromised patients and the results are risk for viral mutation because you are dealing with a live attenuated. Now, what chemoprophylaxis is available? We have gancyclovir that is used as a chemoprophylaxis agent for CMV pneumonitis in cases of bone marrow and solid organ transplant. So patients who are undergoing bone marrow or solid organ transplant should be put on a gancyclovir chemoprophylaxis to prevent them from developing CMV pneumonitis, cytomegalovirus. And in a patient, with established, already established CMV pneumonitis, you can use a combination of gancyclovir with uh, immunoglobulin that are used. And the measles virus, immunoglobulin, um, uh, uh, is used within a week of exposure. So in case of measles, you can still use immunoglobulin after one week of being exposed. And acyclovir is used as a chemoprophylaxis for patients who are exposed or to prevent uh, the development of uh, herpes simplex virus and uh, visit V pneumonitis infection still in immunocompromised patients. Remember that uh, I said that viral pneumonitis is rare, but it is common in uh, immunocompromised patients, and there are two commonest pathogens, CMV and HSV, even VZ. So you can then do chemoprophylaxis to prevent those from happening. So here, the causative agent, we have rhinovirus, no currently approved therapy. It is a, a non-specific management, uh, but we can use it so, uh, as therapy used empirically or under clinical is uh, Tremacambra. We have influenza A virus, we have amatadine and uh, rimatadine. Those are currently approved treatment. We have that influenza A, influenza A and B, we have zanamivir or ozeltamivir or ribavirin. Uh, RSV, we have uh, ribavirin. Parainfluenza, we have uh, alternative therapy as ribavirin. And CMV, we have gancyclovir, HSV, we have acyclovir, and VZ, we have acyclovir. And as alternative, we have fancyclovir. So those are what we call uh, acute respiratory infections. So follow us in our second part of this lecture that deals specifically with uh, bacterial acute respiratory tract infections. Thank you and goodbye.